And let me say thank you as well uh, for your hospitality and the warm welcome you've given us this weekend. I have thoroughly enjoyed being here and uh, almost sorry to see it end. Uh, well, I'm really sorry to see it end because I have to go back to a board meeting. So, so there you go. Our theme has been grace, which there is no better theme in all of Scripture uh, because grace is embodied in Christ and he is the focus of Scripture. And the, the consummate expression of all grace, of course, is the death of Christ on the cross, dying as a substitute in the place of his people, uh, we who sinned deserve what he took on our behalf. And that, as I said, is the consummate expression of grace, his substitution for us. And uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't seem like we really uh, did justice to the subject if we didn't look at the crucifixion of Christ and the account of that. And so I, I want to ask you to turn with me tonight to Matthew 27. We're going to look at verses 15 through 26, about 12 verses there. Matthew 27, this is the account of how Jesus changed places with Barabbas. And here is a vivid and living illustration of the principle of penal substitutionary atonement. Christ literally died in Barabbas's place on a cross meant for Barabbas, probably constructed for him, taking the punishment Barabbas did indeed deserve, while Barabbas himself went free. Now, Barabbas is a name most of us know. There have been novels written about him and fictionalized movies filmed to explore imaginary scenarios about who he may have been and what might have become, uh, what might have become of him after Jesus was crucified. The truth is we know next to nothing about Barabbas. Scripture gives us very few details about him other than his name and a list of the crimes he was charged with. He is like Melchizedek in the sense that he comes on the pages of Scripture with no pedigree and no introduction, and then he disappears without any trace, and he's never mentioned again. And yet, like Melchizedek, Barabbas is an important biblical character. He plays a significant supporting role in all the New Testament crucifixion narratives. He is mentioned by name in all four Gospels, and that alone makes him significant. You know, the birth of Christ is recounted in only two of the four Gospels, and of all the miracles Jesus did, excluding the resurrection, only the feeding of the 5,000 is mentioned in all four Gospels. You got Nicodemus, who appears three times in the Gospel of John at the beginning, in the middle, and the end. He is mentioned only by John, and he makes no appearance in any of the other Gospels. If you compare any harmony of the Gospels, you'll see that surprisingly few incidents in the life of Jesus are given coverage in all four Gospel accounts. The trial before Pontius Pilate is one of those. All four Gospels describe Christ before Pilate, and all four Gospels expressly mention Barabbas. That's significant, and it proves that Barabbas is significant. And furthermore, the relative amount of space given to Barabbas underscores the fact that the Gospel writers themselves considered him a significant character in the crucifixion narrative. No one would dispute that Judas Iscariot uh, the betrayer is a major New Testament character, and yet in all of the New Testament, only 32 verses mention Judas by name, even though he's present for all of Christ's earthly ministry. He's only mentioned by name in 32 verses. By contrast, although Barabbas encounters Christ only tangentially and only on this one occasion, there are 38 verses in the New Testament devoted to describing what happened to Barabbas. So he's a significant person in the Gospel account, chiefly because he is the living embodiment of a helpless, hopeless sinner who is spared from condemnation, even given an undeserved position of privilege, just because Christ took his place on the cross. He's a great picture of how grace works. Barabbas is a flesh and blood symbol for every redeemed sinner. And in a true and literal sense, he could say, he was the first one who could say, Christ died for my sins. 
In fact, he may have been the very first person to whom it might have occurred to make a confession like that. During those dark hours, while the crucifixion drama was playing out, even while the disciples were scattered and confused, and even while those closest to Jesus were wondering at the meaning of all of this, Barabbas was already fully aware in a unique and particular sense that Jesus was dying in his place. Now, I'm not suggesting he knew this with the full conviction of saving faith, but in a rudimentary sense, he must have had some crude understanding of the principle that lies at the heart of the atonement because in a literal, physical sense, Christ had taken his place on the cross Christ had borne the the condemnation that was due to Barabbas, and what Jesus did made it possible for Barabbas to go free, all without any work or merit on Barabbas' part. He did not deserve the favor he was shown. And that that is what makes this such a great picture of grace. That's also what the gospel is all about. The cross is the heart of the gospel message. We preach Christ crucified. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. In short, Christ took our place. He bore the full weight of the punishment we are due, and he died in our stead so that we could be freed from the penalty and the power and the bondage of sin. And Barabbas uniquely illustrates that truth in a dramatic and powerful way. Christ literally changed places with him at the behest of a weak-willed Roman ruler and the bloodthirsty multitudes. And I want to look at that with you tonight. Here's some context. Matthew 27 begins with the morning scene after the night of Jesus' betrayal. When Jesus was first arrested in Gethsemane, it was practically a mob scene. Judas led the way, of course, with the Jewish officials who ordered Jesus' arrest in tow. These were representatives of the Sanhedrin. They were the ruling body that presided over the temple grounds and had charge of all the religious affairs in Israel. But the Jewish officials also brought with them a large detachment of Roman troops. Matthew 26, 47, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And the Gospel of John is where we learn that that great crowd, John 18, 3 says, came with lanterns and torches and weapons. It was a band of soldiers and some officers, and they had to be Roman soldiers because the Jews were not permitted to raise their own militia. So these soldiers, John says, had been procured by the Sanhedrin, by these ruling Jewish officials, probably taken from the Praetorian Guard, whose headquarters were immediately adjacent to the temple. And so they seized Jesus, They take him to the house of the high priest, and now the high priest that year technically was Caiaphas, but his father-in-law, Annas, was the real power behind the priesthood, and so they hauled Jesus to the house of Annas first. He's the old guy. He's He's not the official high priest, but he is the one who holds the power. And so the first trial begins there, probably in in a yard between the houses of Caiaphas and Annas. Annas examines Jesus first, and then turns him over to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, and then the whole body of the Sanhedrin puts him on trial. And so this is a three-phase trial, and it lasts all night. Phase three, as Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, this assembly of of, uh, leading Pharisees and Sadducees, Uh, Phase 3 here is mentioned at the top of our chapter. It ends at daybreak with the chief priests and elders, that's the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, going into deliberations to decide their verdict and to discuss what to do with Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. 
Mark 15, 1 says it like this. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, that's the Sanhedrin, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. Now, they had to turn Jesus over to Pilate because although the Sanhedrin had authority to try and condemn someone who was charged with blasphemy or some other crime against the religious authority, they technically needed the authorization of Rome before they would actually execute someone. And, and apparently if they, if they caught someone in a wanton act of blasphemy, they sometimes took up stones and executed the blasphemer on the spot. And history suggests the, that Roman officials generally looked the other way when that happened. The Pharisees actually did try to do that with Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 59. They picked up stones to stone him. And they did actually stone Stephen on the spot in Acts 7.58, but in this case, they were charging Jesus with past crimes under the cover of night, and so they wanted at least a facade of official justice on all of their proceedings, and so they take him to Pilate. Pilate was the Roman official in charge of that territory. He actually lived in Caesarea, which is three days' journey to the north along the Mediterranean coast, two or three days' journey, but on, that, on this day, on this particular day, Pilate happened to be in Jerusalem for the Passover holiday. And so Jesus was brought before Pilate. The express purpose of the Sanhedrin in doing this was, according to Matthew 27, verse 1, to put Jesus to death. They were asking Pilate to authorize the death penalty against Jesus. So verse 2, they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. And while this is going on, verses 3 through 10 give the account of Judas's suicide. And, and Judas goes out and kills himself, and at the end of that little vignette, we're back at Pilate's headquarters. John's gospel at this point fills in some details for us, and you can tell from John's description that there was a cold hostility between Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin. John 18, verse 28 says this, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. It's kind of a snide answer like, look, take our word for it. You need to execute this guy, and if you ask too many questions, we're going to make trouble for you. So, verse 31, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. They were determined to put Jesus to death, and they needed Pilate to sign off on that. And then verse 33 of John 18 says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And that is exactly where Matthew 27, 11 takes up. If you're still in Matthew 27, look at verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. And thus begins a whole new series of hearings, a new trial under Roman authorities. And this likewise becomes a three-phase trial. Pilate questions Jesus, and it's clear that Pilate has no desire and no political interest in carrying out the wishes of the Sanhedrin. He's not willing to execute Jesus just because they demanded it. And so at the end of this first phase of the Roman trial, John 18:38 says, Pilate went back inside or went back outside to the Jews and told them, "I find no guilt in him." He questions Jesus, goes back outside, tells the Sanhedrin, "He doesn't look guilty to me." So Luke 23, then, verses 5 through 7, tell us that when Pilate pronounced this first not guilty verdict, the priests and the Pharisees were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. And when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. And so phase two of the Roman trial begins. Herod, who was really the one in charge of the territory of, of Galilee, 
he sees Jesus, he questions him, he mocks him for a while, he dresses him in a phony robe, and then he sends him right back to Pilate, like Jesus is now a political hot potato. And so we come to our passage. Pilate, who, who doesn't want to be involved in this, but he's trapped, he has figured out a way he thinks he can rid himself of this entire mess. There was a custom, an official goodwill gesture on behalf of the Roman procurator, who, whereby he would release uh, one political prisoner during Passover, and Pilate figures this tradition might give him a way to disperse this lynch mob without having to order the death of a man Pilate had already pronounced not guilty. So here's our passage, Matthew 27, starting at verse 15. I'll read the whole passage. It's about 12 verses. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. You can see right through the hearts of the Sanhedrin. Besides, verse 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now, practically every flavor of human depravity is represented in that account. Specifically, there are three categories of sinners who appear in major roles here. There's Barabbas, he's the notorious sinner, whose wickedness is obvious and well-defined and impossible to conceal. Then there is this angry mob representing the religious sinner whose wickedness is hidden under a mask of religiosity and self-righteousness. And finally, then there's Pilate, the respectable sinner, whose wickedness is papered over with a veneer of worldly nobility. And what I want to do with you tonight is sort of examine those different kinds of uh, sinners, those different characters, one at a time. The first is the notorious sinner, sinner represented by Barabbas. Now, the text I read to you was from the English Standard Version. Verse 16 of, uh, says of Barabbas that he was a notorious prisoner. That's also how the New American Standard Bible translates it. The Greek word simply means remarkable or noteworthy. And it can be used, we, you know, we, we think, uh, we, we see kind of negative connotations in the word notorious. This word can be used like that to signify a negative reputation like infamy, notoriety, disrepute. But the Greek expression is not inherently negative, like the English word notorious. The King James Version calls Barabbas a notable prisoner. And that's literally what the word means. Now, Barabbas certainly was notorious. That's probably the main sense this term means to convey, because Barabbas was infamous. He was scandalous. He was renowned precisely because he was so thoroughly reprehensible. His villainy was both abominable and well-known, and we're going to talk about his crimes in a minute. But this term also might signify that he came from an influential family, a family of high status. So in that sense, he's notable in the sense that he was high-born and aristocratic. In fact, his name, Barabbas, is pretty easy to translate even if you know a minimal amount of Hebrew or Aramaic. The prefix bar means son. You know, Peter, for example, was Simon bar Jonah, or Simon the son of Jonah. And a Jewish boy who's entering 
manhood becomes bar mitzvah, or a son of the law. So bar, that means son. Abba, of course, is a familiar name for father. Romans 8.15, we cry Abba, father. So Barabbas literally means son of the father. That might be a kind of descriptive nickname for a mischievous kid whose family always said, like mine did, he's just like his father. But more likely in that culture, this was a title of respect for someone with an imminent father, especially uh, if his father was a rabbi. This was, in fact, a common surname in the rabbinical class, son of the father, meaning he's the rabbi's son. But in any case, Barabbas had clearly become notorious because of his crimes. That is what had made him famous by the time Jesus comes into the story. He's notorious. He fits into the worst category of criminals. He was condemned to die in the most shameful manner on a cross at the hands of the Romans so that whatever he once may have been, he was now utterly without honor and without hope. Scripture says he was guilty of Three crimes. John 18, verse 40 says, Now Barabbas was a robber, and the Greek term there literally means plunderer, like a pirate. And it evokes the notion of a marauding outlaw who finances other crimes with ill-gotten gain. So he's a thief and a brigand. It's the same word used in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 30, where Jesus says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, brigands, the worst kinds of criminals who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. This is the very worst kind of outlaw, a career criminal. And by the way, this is the same word used in Matthew 27, 44, which speaks of the robbers who were crucified with Christ. Two robbers on either side of him. These men were undoubtedly confederates of Barabbas because it's clear from the account that the Roman authorities were prepared to execute three men that day. Barabbas seems to have been the leader and the most famous one because he's the only one named, but all of them are described as robbers using that same term. And we commonly speak of these men as thieves, you know, the thief on the cross, Christ crucified between two thieves. But understand, their crime was not petty thievery. According to Mark 15, verse 7, this was a band of violent rebels, anti-Roman seditionists. Most likely they were members of an extremist Jewish political party known as the Zealots. Many of them, the worst Zealots, rank outlaws who had incurred their condemnation by fomenting riots and insurrection against the rule of Rome. And that explains why these men were condemned to crucifixion. See, Rome had no patience with people like this, and they were typically condemned to a speedy and very public execution. And part of the notoriety of Barabbas lay in the fact that he had committed an act of wanton murder, or possibly even multiple murders, in one of these violent uprisings. Mark 15, verse 7, introduces him to us this way. Among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection... There was a man called Barabbas. And Luke 23, 19 affirms this, saying that Barabbas had been imprisoned for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. So he starts a riot, and in the midst of it, he commits a murder, or maybe multiple murders. So he is a bloody, brutal criminal, already judged guilty, already condemned to die that very morning. Maybe he had once been noble, but he was clearly not so now. Now, Pilate, specifically, of all the Roman governors in history, Pilate was especially well-known for his hatred of insurrectionists. Luke 13, verse 1, mentions the fact that Pilate had mingled the blood of some Galileans with their sacrifices. In other words, he desecrated the Jewish temple. This is, why, this is one of the major reasons why his relationship with Sanhedrin was so volatile. He had desecrated the temple in his pursuit of revenge against some revolutionaries from Galilee. And the victims of this atrocity were most likely followers, as a, of, followers of a famous rebel who was known as Judas of Galilee. He's, he's mentioned, actually, in Acts 
5.37, a different Judas from Judas Iscariot, but Judas the insurrectionist, mentioned in Acts 5.37, and Josephus, the secular historian, also wrote about Judas of Galilee as well. Josephus says this, quote, he led his countrymen into rebellion, declaring it an evil should they suffer tribute to be paid to the Romans. So he was, he was saying that it's evil to pay taxes to Rome. This, of course, was one of the controversies that Jesus had to answer and that the, the Pharisees actually put the question to him to try to embarrass him. And by the way, Josephus also says of Judas of Galilee that he was the co-founder of the party of the Zealots, along with Zadok the Pharisee. And Galilee, the, the same region where Jesus ministered for most of his earthly ministry, Galilee in particular harbored large numbers of zealots and other anti-Roman insurgents. And Pilate had apparently tracked these zealots, Galilean zealots, to the temple in Jerusalem, and he killed them right there at the altar so that their blood was mingled with the sacrifices that the priests were in the process of offering. And, and that just gives you the flavor of Pilate's hatred of the cult of the zealots. It was so fierce that he was willing to desecrate the temple, which, by the way, jeopardized Pilate's career because it provoked even more widespread rebellion throughout all of Israel, and Caesar became very unhappy with Pilate. And the fact that Pilate's treatment of insurrectionists was so brutal probably also explains why when the Sanhedrin brought Jesus to Pilate, it was insurrection rather than blasphemy that was the charge they brought against him in Pilate's presence. Remember, they tried him for blasphemy, but when they charged him in front of Pilate, they called him an insurrectionist because they thought Pilate would treat that more harshly. Luke, two, Luke 23, verse 2. They began to accuse him before Pilate, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So they're giving lying testimony to Pilate against Christ. But when Pilate sees Jesus in person and questions him, he knows immediately that this is a ruse because Jesus was no insurrectionist. He didn't fit the profile. The Sanhedrin themselves clearly posed a more imminent threat to Roman rule than Jesus did. And Pilate, of all people, knew a zealot when he saw one, and Jesus was no zealot. So Pilate, who was a very shrewd politician, finds himself in a dilemma. Given his reputation for being harsh, together with his previous desecration of the temple, and because of other diplomatic faux pas against the Jews that he had committed, he could not afford to provoke the Sanhedrin. His position as Roman procurator was already in jeopardy. And even though he knows that they're simply trying to execute Jesus on trumped-up charges, that this whole thing is a phony uh, kangaroo court, even though he senses that the Sanhedrin are trying to bully him, Pilate, into something he's not inclined to do, he's not in a position politically to rebuff them, especially with a, this growing mob of agitated people under his window screaming for Jesus' blood. He couldn't afford another riot, nor did he want, especially on Passover, and he didn't want to do something that would exacerbate his reputation as a ruthless tyrant, and so he hatches a plan. In, in my pastor, John MacArthur's words, this was a last-ditch effort to escape the dilemma the Sanhedrin had created for him. This was a conflict between his conscience and his career. It was a choice between satisfying the Jews he hated or the Caesar he feared. And it was customary, Scripture says, for the Roman governor to release a Hebrew prisoner from Roman custody every year at Passover. It was a kind of a gesture of goodwill and a symbol of Rome's respect for the Jewish religion. And most likely, these would normally have been either petty criminals or, or more likely nonviolent political prisoners. And so the governor would select a handful of candidates for early release, and he would permit the citizens to select one of their choice. Never, ever would a man like Pilate willingly release a violent radical like Barabbas. And in fact, in all likelihood, 
Barabbas' crimes were so heinous and his reputation so bad that Pilate chose him because he was certain that the people would never sanction his release. It's like releasing, you know, Charles Manson back into, back into society again. And so Jesus chooses, or, or so he chooses Jesus and Barabbas as the two candidates for that year's amnesty. One or the other of these guys, he says, here's Jesus and there's Barabbas, you choose. Matthew 27, 17. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? By the way, I ought to mention that several of the earliest Greek manuscripts from this text treat Barabbas as a surname and actually give Jesus as this man's first name. Instead of Barabbas, they call him Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, of course, is the is the Greek equivalent of Joshua, and it was a common name. And so this may have been Barabbas' actual first name. If so, it would make good sense of the expression in verse 17. Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus who is called Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? And if that is the correct reading of the original text, it would mean that the choices Pilate set before this Jewish mob were both called Jesus, son of the Father. One of them was holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. The other was as thoroughly wicked and as militantly malicious as anyone you could possibly imagine. Now, common sense might suggest that Pilate's stratagem here was a good one. It's very clever. After all, on the one hand, the people had every reason to fear and even hate a man like Barabbas. And on the other hand, just a few days earlier, practically the whole city had turned out in unison to welcome Jesus with cries of Hosanna. Of course they were going to choose Jesus as the one to be released, right? Wrong. And that brings us to the second category of sinners who play a major role in this drama. This is the religious sinner represented by this mob. Religious sinners. Now understand... This mob consists of the highest order of priests and their followers. These are religious leaders and a a group of their disciples whose identity is defined by their religion. These are not rank pagans who pride themselves in bloodthirstiness. These are the same common people who at the height of Jesus' ministry had followed him in great throngs. In the words of Mark 12, 37, the common people heard him gladly. He had healed their sick, he had raised their dead, he had cast out demons in their midst, he had fed them both literally and spiritually. He had never done them any wrong. All he had ever done was speak truth to them. But at the instigation of the Sanhedrin, they turned against him in a way that is shocking for its irrationality. This incident perfectly illustrates how the whole world is drawn to that which is evil and corrupt, while fallen human nature inevitably expresses its true character in a violent hatred of everything that is pure and holy. That's fallen human nature in its essence. You see it right here. You see it reflected in society every day. You know, secular culture today is intolerant of whatever is genuinely pure and holy, while cultivating an insatiable craving for everything that's evil. And it's getting worse all the time To quote S. Lewis Johnson, this is the madness of the multitude's choice. The hostility of this crowd against Jesus is just stunning. And even more so when you remember that only a few days have elapsed since his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There's simply no good reason for the malice these people spew at Christ. But it reveals how easily suggestible a multitude can be. All of this venom was deliberately stirred up by the Sanhedrin. And what you have represented by this mob are two varieties of religious sinners. Some of them are rank hypocrites, and some are just pathologically fickle. The priests and the Pharisees and the other religious rulers are full-blown hypocrites. They, They gave lip service to the law of God and the faith of their fathers, but what they really craved was the praise and admiration of men. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they can be seen by others, Jesus said. 
They don't really care what God thinks of them, or at least they don't think about it. And here you see perhaps the most glaring symbol of their hypocrisy. According to John 11:53, these very men, the Sanhedrin, had been making plans for several months to put Jesus to death. Actually, they had sought to kill him as far back as the end of John 8. And they had then passed a final verdict against him in a secret council shortly after he raised Lazarus from the dead. You'll find that in John 11. And now they subject him to the pretense of a trial before a kangaroo court under cover of dark with this very same group of men sitting in judgment against him who long before this had secretly covenanted amongst themselves to kill him. And so they are desperate for Pilate to sentence him to death to, or at least to execute their sentence against him, in order to give their phony proceedings the appearance of legitimacy, these guys are hypocrites to the core. Now the crowd, the mob of people, are just pathologically fickle. They are easily suggestible. They are hate-filled, resentful, self-indulgent, and now suddenly bloodthirsty again, just mobs of people had shouted Hosanna on the streets just a few days ago, but, but the collective cry of the gathering crowd now becomes, let him be crucified. This is surely the most egregious example of the fickleness of unbelief in all of human history. And yet they're doing this in the name of religion. They're calling for Jesus' death while acting as if they're doing God's work. They think they're doing God a favor. This is pure, unmitigated evil. This is actually a far worse evil than the more notorious crimes that had made Barabbas infamous. And it's a reminder of something I've said many times in the past. There is no greater expression of human wickedness than religion, false religion, fickle religious fervor, rank hypocrisy masquerading as religious orthodoxy. All of these are expressions of the worst kinds of wickedness. We tend to think of you know, religion as, as the best and highest of things the human race represents. But false religion is the worst evil of all. We tend to, we tend to forget that. That unless it is genuine faith in the true God, religion is actually the most sinister expression of human depravity. Because it's a, it's a cover-up for our sin. It's an attempt to evade the justice and truth of God with, with ideas invented out of the wicked human mind. And in the worst cases, such as we see in our text here, the religious sinner will invariably reveal a heart that is every bit as dark and bloodthirsty and savage as the tortured soul of a rank outlaw like Barabbas. These people are religious, but they represent the religion of a fallen world. Even though these are the, these are the leaders of the Jews, they, they, had, they thought anchored their religion in the Old Testament. They thought they were being biblical, or at least they kept up that pretense. This is not true religion at all. And the proof that they are, these guys are worldly to the core is their absolute, irrational, incorrigible hatred of Jesus. Hatred of Jesus is the hallmark of worldly values. 1 John 3.13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's John 15, 18, and 19. And here's something you may not have noticed. It is the religious people of this world who hate authentic Christianity the most. Religious people. John 16, verse 2. Jesus said, Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. We see that played out in the headlines every time there's a new story about religious fanatics in the Middle East beheading Christians. In other words, a purely religious motive lies behind all that murderous hatred. Just like here, it wasn't the pagans who were fomenting violence against Christ. It was the high priest and his cohorts who were acting in the name of Yahweh. 
This is what the very worst kind of religion looks like. And the fact that they were doing it in God's name is what makes it so profoundly wicked. But there's a third category of human evil that figures heavily into this count. We've seen the notorious sinner, represented by Barabbas. We've seen the religious sinner, represented by the mob. Now look at the respectable sinner, represented by Pontius Pilate. Pilate, of course, had at his disposal all the advantages of political power, civil authority, Roman military might. He was worthy of respect, if not for his character, then certainly for his position. And Pilate was not a religious man in any way that shows. In fact, the heedless way he had desecrated the Jewish temple reflects a, a reckless contempt for the God of Scripture. And yet, Pilate had many of the qualities that command worldly respect. He was a shrewd, practical, powerful man and a strong natural leader who spoke with authority, who wasted no words. He had risen to the highest ranks in the Roman government, which meant his loyalty and his basic reputation for integrity must have been beyond question. He was a respectable man. He would not have been in that position if he were a wantonly dishonorable man. And you can see flashes of noble character in his dealings with Jesus. He clearly did not want to participate in this travesty, uh, this deliberate miscarriage of justice that the Sanhedrin had conspired to perpetrate against Jesus. Pilate already knew what the Jews were doing as soon as he saw this situation. He read their evil motives, verse 18. He knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. He saw clearly that it was not guilt but goodness in Jesus that the priests and religious leaders hated so much. His original intention was merely to give Jesus a few cursory lashes and let him go. Luke 23, 15 and 16, Pilate says, Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. And he, Pilate actually declares Jesus' innocence repeatedly. Luke 23, 14, Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. John 18, 38, he went back outside to the Jews and told them again, I find no guilt in him. John 19, 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And then two verses later, John 19, 6, one last time, Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. He's practically begging this mob to disperse and let Jesus go. But in Matthew 27, 23, when the mob is shouting, Let him be crucified, Pilate even responds, Why? What evil has he done? But Scripture says, they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. And his proposal that the multitudes should choose between Jesus and Barabbas was actually a brilliant maneuver on Pilate's part. He had every reason to think they would choose Jesus for amnesty and Barabbas for crucifixion. And if the people simply did what common sense would seem to dictate, Pilate would have gained an amazing victory over the Sanhedrin that day. He could have released Jesus, pointing out that, you know, he's merely fulfilling the will of the people. That would have removed this moral dilemma from burdening his conscience. It would have had the double benefit of utterly humiliating Pilate's most obnoxious political rivals, the Sanhedrin. But as Matthew relates the narrative, here's what happened. When Pilate first asked, verse 17, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? It was at that precise moment that his wife sent to him a message. Verse 19, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Here's another reason Pilate was a respectable man. He had a perceptive and considerate wife. That very moment, morning, she, she had been awakened from some kind of vivid dream about Jesus, that gave her concern for her husband's welfare. And notice that she acknowledges that Jesus is a righteous man. She doesn't seem hostile to Jesus. And I gather what she suffered, she uses that word, what she suffered because of her dream was suffering some kind of mental distress or pangs of conscience or worry over her husband's welfare, something because her dream had revealed that Jesus was a truly just man 
suffering unjustly. And so she tries valiantly to get that message to her husband. But while Pilate is receiving his wife's message, the Sanhedrin and their comrades seize that opportunity, that interruption, to pass through the mob and spread the word that they were to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus, verse 20. And the crowd, like, like any lynch mob, were easy to persuade by the mere power of suggestion as the Sanhedrin's order is passed in waves and whispers through this crowd. And so turning from the messenger who had brought Mrs. Pilate's warning, verse 21, the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. So Pilate is now caught in his own trap. Having offered to bow to the will of the people, he cannot escape this gross injustice that they're demanding him to authorize. To deny them the crucifixion they craved would cause great and possibly fatal political damage to his career. What he failed to consider was that by consenting to hand Jesus over, he was incurring eternal judgment against his soul. If he had the ears to listen, that is what his wife's warnings signified. That dream was a providential token of God's grace. And notice, Pilate totally ignored it. So that when push came to shove, Pilate showed that under that respectable veneer, he was an evil man. He was in bondage to sin just as surely as Barabbas, the Sanhedrin, and the bloodthirsty mob, and all of these other characters in this tale, except for Jesus. But when Pilate's own ambition was on the line. His honor was for sale, and he bartered it away without a second thought, all out of political expediency. He was so caught up in worldly power and worldly wisdom that he missed the significance of the drama that was playing out before his very eyes. Think of this. The very incarnation of truth, the way and the truth and the life, is standing right before Pilate, in abject humility, with his hands bound and his back already bloody, and Pilate has the temerity to ask the sneering question, what is truth? He's like a postmodernist, you know? How could he be so blind to truth incarnate? One thing is certain, none of the rulers of this age understood the truth, because if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's 1 Corinthians 2.8. Pilate sold out because of sheer political expediency. Verse 24, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And you know what? That symbolic washing did nothing to cleanse Pilate of guilt. He was not innocent of Jesus' blood. Turning Jesus over to this mob was an act of cruelty and cowardice and compromise, and criminal malfeasance. This supposedly great, respectable man of honor sold out his own principles when it counted the most, because he valued the favor of men more than he valued his own integrity. He was as guilty as those who had thoughtlessly cursed themselves and their children. Verse 25, and all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Verse 26, then Pilate released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him over to be crucified. He had the power to stop this entire charade, but he caved in to the mob mentality and handed Jesus over, even though he knew Jesus was perfectly innocent and repeatedly had declared him to be innocent. And so you see these three categories of sinners, all of whom still exist Today, there are the respectable sinners who don't necessarily hate Jesus or overtly refuse him, but they are complicit in his crucifixion by their apathy and indifference and indecision or inaction. Like Pilate, they don't see any fault in him, but they don't bow to him as Lord either. Then there are the religious sinners, some of whom are openly hostile to the Christ of Scripture, some of whom are hypocrites, some of whom are just pathologically fickle. The evangelical movement today is full of people who are pathologically fickle. And eventually, religious sinners always end up opposing Christ in one way or another. And in the words of 
Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, they crucify once again the Son of God to their own harm, holding him up to contempt. And then there are the notorious sinners, people whose sin has no veneer and no mask to cover it up, and they might seem to humanize to be the most hopeless of all sinners. You look at them from a human perspective and you'll think, these are the worst, they're the most hopeless. But in reality, they're the ones to whom the gospel promises the most because Christ came not to call the righteous or the respectable, but notorious sinners to repentance. He died in the place and in the stead of sinners like Barabbas and like me. And like you, if you're someone who confesses your sin rather than covering it up. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is the gospel. That's the very embodiment of grace. And it's perfectly illustrated in the release of Barabbas. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures so that in the words of Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't matter how notorious your sin might be. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we are sinners with no more righteousness of our own than Barabbas had. We've incurred a guilt of our own that is as dark as his, as deserving of condemnation, perhaps even worse than his. We thank you that in your love and your grace, you sent your son to bear the price of sin on behalf of all who trust him. Seal our trust in him. Give us grace to honor him in the way we live as redeemed people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.